Okay. Good morning and welcome to Sunday morning Bible study at Freedom Point Church of God. Thank you for coming this morning. This today we're going to continue our study on the feast of first fruits, and we'll finish this this feast next week. Will be our last teaching on the feast of first fruits. So, what is the feast of first fruits? It is a beautiful picture type shadow picture of us having dinner with the King, King Jesus. Our beloved bridegroom. In Leviticus chapter 23, verses 10 through 13, and I've got so much to cover today. Some of the passages, I won't read every word, I'll just refer to them. In verse 11, God instructed his people Now, when you come into the promised land, the land which I promised to give you, and when you reap the harvest from your fields, you're to bring a sheep of the first fruits, the first ripe grain of your harvest. Verse 11, what were they to do? They were to wave it before the Lord, and they were to present it as an offering unto the Lord. And verse 12, you shall offer on that day when ye wave the sheep, a he lamb, a male lamb without blemish, And verse 13, the King James says a meat offering, but it's a meal offering. And it's to be a fine flour, meat liver mixed with oil. An offering made by fire unto the Lord. What's it for? A sweet-smelling savor. And also, God said, bring a drink offering. What was the drink offering? Wine. And God said, now listen, on this day, that you bring the first ripe grain from your field on the first fruit, the first fruits that yours are away, then you are to celebrate a feast, the feast of first fruits, just like all of the other feasts are uh, all about having dinner with the King, King Jesus, our precious beloved bridegroom, and we his bride. Even to the very details of the offerings on the Feast of First Fruits are symbolizing, they're pointing to having dinner with the king. Here we have the lamb, fine flour, oil, and wine. What what do we have? We're having dinner with the king. We will dine with King Jesus, our beloved bridegroom, at the marriage supper on our wedding day. Oh, but there's a price to be paid in order to be his bride. It's far more than being born again, just getting saved and getting your fire insurance. How many times have I heard that statement over the years? I'm saved. I got my fire insurance. I'm going to go to heaven. And the Christians don't ever grow, they don't ever read the Bible, study the Word, aren't interested in being faithful and coming to church, hearing the Word, sitting under the Word. They got their fire insurance, so if they're going to escape hell, that's all they're worried about. And they're never interested in growing in the Lord, and never interested in immaturing and dying to their flesh. So that we can be transformed, changed more into his likeness, into his image. Revelation chapter 19, verses 7 through 9. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. What? You mean it's not automatic? You mean there's something we have to do? Yes! His wife had made herself ready, and the Lord was granted that she should be arrayed, clothed in fine linen, clean and white. What is this fine linen? For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now notice verse 7 says it, his wife had made herself ready. Being the bride of Christ is not automatic. I wish 
wish it was. I wish it was just as simple as getting your fire insurance, getting born again, and, and escaping hell. No, 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 no. It's not that simple. If you want to be a part of the bride of Christ, it is not just getting born again, but you, the bride, must make herself ready. And the bride in every Jewish wedding and Bible days, the bride had to prepare her own wedding garment, her wedding dress. What is our wedding garment? Going to be made of righteousness. We just read it in verse 8. There is a price to be paid if you want to become a part of the bride company. Oh, Jesus is coming back for a bride without spot, without wrinkle. Oh, and we have to grow. We have to mature in the Lord and let the washing of the water of the word wash away all of our spots, our blemishes, all those areas in our lives that are not like King Jesus. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 27, says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it. How? With the washing of the water of the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it, the church, should be holy and without blemish. Our beloved bridegroom is coming for a bride without spot, without blemishes. What's going to remove the spots, the blemishes from his bride, from us? Verse 26, we will be cleansed and made righteous by the washing of the water of the Word. The Word of God is what will cause our wedding garments of fine linen to be clean and white and all of the spots, the blemishes, the impurities, the, the sins, all of the things in our life that's not like our beloved bridegroom. The Word of God is what will wash, cleanse all that away. The fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. We read it in Revelation. Now, oh, I, I love to do jumping, shouting, teaching, but this is not one of them. So be warned. I, I love to teach all the good, the good things, the easy things, the blessing words, don't you, Pastor? But sometimes... God gives you a hard word, a tough word, but it's a necessary word. I determined years ago I'm not going to be teacher feel good, but I'm going to be teacher tell truth. It's tight, but it's right. you got to give the whole counsel of the word of God. Not only just the jumping, shouting, feel good teachings and sermons, but the tough words, the, the words that make us grow and mature. We, we just cannot present teachings that will tickle the ears like the scripture says. But it will not help the people grow and mature spiritually. Oh, hallelujah. If you want to be the bride of Christ, there is a price to be paid. What price are you willing to pay to know him? To know our beloved bridegroom? Deeply, intimately, having that intimate relationship with him. What are you willing to give up in your life to pay the price in order to be his bride? Jesus is the first fruits. He is, he fulfilled this feast, the feast of first fruits. When he died on the cross the third day, he was resurrected came out of that grave fulfilling this feast, the feast of first fruits. Matthew chapter 27, verses 51 through 53. The veil of the temple was rent in twain, or in two, from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. The moment Jesus died on that cross, and the graves were opened, and many of the bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection. 
and went into the holy city and appeared unto me. Almost 40 years ago, a lady came up to me in church and she said, you study, you read the word and study all the time. I want to ask you a question. Why? And she opened her Bible to this passage and she said, why does this scripture say that many of the saints arose? Why does it not say all of the saints arose from the grave? And I looked at her and I said, I don't know. And she said, well, you're smart and you study the word all the time. So you find the answer and you tell me. Well, I would, that just sparked my interest too. I had never thought about it. I had, I, and I went on a quest to find the answer. And I studied this on and off from time to time. I would research, study, read everything I could find on this subject for almost 40 years. And I did not find the answer. I talked to my Messianic Jewish rabbi. Every time I go to synagogue, I'd ask him questions. I'm sure he dreaded to see me coming. Oh, no, here she is again. She's going to bombard me with Bible questions. I talked to him several times. He didn't know the answer. And then I asked my Bible teacher. Before my accident, I would drive for hours. I'd work all day, get in the car, and drive for hours to be in his meetings, sit under his teaching. He, would, he is the most learned Bible scholar that I know personally. He speaks four languages. He has a learned doctorate degree. He speaks Hebrew, Greek, Latin, and, of course, English. He taught several years in different Bible colleges. And so I asked him, I said, why wasn't all of the saints resurrected from the grave? And he looked at me and he thought a minute and he said, we'll talk about it. That's what he would tell me when I would stump him. I was always asking him questions. Sometimes he didn't know the answer, and when he didn't know, he'd say, we'll talk about it. That meant he was going to have to research himself and get back with me, but he never did. So nobody could answer this question. And But one thing that Dr. Bagnell did point out to me that I hadn't thought about in concerning this passage is the verse that says that the graves were opened and many of the bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the grave after his resurrection. He said, think about it, that when Jesus died, when that earthquake hit, the graves were opened and they still lay there in the, their graves. And he crossed his arms like this over his chest like someone laying in a casket. And he said they laid there, their graves were open, but they did not come out of those graves. They didn't come back to life until after Jesus was resurrected and came out of that grave on the third day. But he couldn't tell me why many of the saints arose, but not all of them came out of that grave. So I had been on a quest for almost 40 years to find the answer, and it wasn't until I studied this feast in detail, the Feast of First Fruits, that I found the answer. And I finally settled on the answer to this question, and I'll never be moved off of what I now believe the answer to be. Would you like to know what it is? Yes. I'm glad you asked. I'm going to tell you. These Old Testament saints that arose from the grave on the third day, they were the first fruits to be resurrected from the dead. Jesus presented himself. He took himself and presented himself as the first fruits resurrected from the dead. He took his blood to the heavenly holy of holies, cleansed the, the mercy seat, came back to earth. Then on the 40th day, Jesus, when he ascended, <coughs> he presented these saints that had resurrected from the grave. He, he took them with him to heaven when he ascended. And he presented them as his first fruits offering. He presented them before the Father as the first fruits offering. Think about it. Jesus arose from the dead first. Now he fulfilled this feast, the feast of first fruits. He came out of that grave three days after being in that grave. And then he fulfilled the, this feast, the Feast of First Fruits, which takes place three days after the Feast of 
Jesus after he had presented himself as the first fruits, the firstborn from the dead. Then he presented these Old Testament saints as his first fruits offering to the Father. All of the Old Testament saints were not resurrected, only those who were the first fruits to be presented before the Father. And when Jesus ascended, he ascended, the scripture tells us, with the clouds, not in the clouds like everybody preaches and teaches. No, he ascended into heaven with the cloud of witnesses. Who, uh, who was this cloud? The Old Testament saints in Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. The, uh, the disciples, they were there with Jesus, and Jesus began to ascend back into the heavens. While they, the disciples, beheld, while they watched, Jesus was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men, two angels stood by them, stood by the, the disciples in white apparel, white, white robes. Verse 11, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye here gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. The angel said to the, to the disciples, that Jesus would return in like manner, in the same way as you have just watched him go up into heaven. How will Jesus return from heaven? Revelation chapter 1 verse 7. And behold, look, he cometh with clouds, not in clouds. He cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. In the book of Daniel, Daniel was a prophet. Daniel looked down the corridors of time, hundreds of years, and he saw even thousands of years when this would, event would take place. And Daniel, the prophet, wrote about it in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. One like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven. It doesn't say that Jesus will return in the clouds, in literal white, puffy clouds. It says that he will return with clouds. What clouds are these scriptures talking about? The clouds are referring to people in scripture. Cloud of witnesses. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1 says, Jesus will return not in clouds, puppy clouds, that we can look up into the heavens and see, but Jesus will return with the clouds. The cloud of Old Testament saints, the ones that were raised from the dead on the third day, and all of the other saints after them who have died and who have paid the price to grow in the Lord, to mature and not remain immature baby Christians. These are the mature saints who will come back and rule and reign with King Jesus. They are the ones who paid the price to become the bride of Christ. Like I said, unfortunately, not every Christian is going to be a part of the bridal company, a part of the bride of Christ. How do we know? The scripture is very, very clear about this. One scripture, look at Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed, we are surrounded about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us, what are we to do? Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. For consider him, lest we be weary or grow discouraged, lest we be wearied and faint in our minds. Who are we surrounded by? A great cloud of witnesses. Hebrews 12, verse 1. Who are the cloud of witnesses? The Old Testament saints. Those the, are the many, not all, but the many that came out of their graves on that third day when, after Jesus was resurrected. And 
the other saints after them who have been willing to lay aside every weight and every sin, who have been willing to pay the price to be the part of the bride of Christ. Oh, look at it again. The Old Testament saints, the writers of Hebrew, just wrote about in chapter 11. All through that chapter, you need to read it. It's called the Great Hall of Fame of Faith chapter in our Bible. It refers to people like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, David, Gideon, Samson, Sarah, Rahab, all the others listed in this chapter. Oh, but not only these Old Testament saints, but all of the saints who have paid the price to lay aside the weight, the sin, and lay aside everything and let the Holy Spirit do that work within them to change them into to the likeness of their of the Lord Jesus, our beloved bridegroom. Those who have paid the price to mature and grow spiritually and become mature Christians, these are the great cloud of witnesses who they are, as it were, looking over the, the grandstands of heaven and watching us run our race, cheering us on, encouraging us not to be discouraged, not to become weary and, and quit in our race in this life, to be changed into his likeness and into his image. And I, when I've taught this passage over the years, I, I love to do illustrations. And in my Bible study several years ago, I taught this. And I had a racetrack taped off on the carpet. And I had runners. They had they were in uniform and had numbers on their back. And, and uh, I had a fake gun pistol. And I, I fired the, the starting shot. They all took off running. And then I, one of them, they, they just sat down on the racetrack. Oh, I'm just so tired. I don't want to get up and go to the, to the Sunday morning Bible study. I was just going to sleep in today. Oh, I don't feel like reading my Bible today. What good does it do anyway? I'm just, I'm just going to watch TV instead. And so I had one just quitting the race, just sitting down on, on, the, on the track, too lazy to walk over and get out of, out of the track. And then I'd have one that would, would just turn around and walk off and just say, this is not worth it, living this Christian life is too hard, it's too difficult, I'm tired of the, the struggle, I'm tired of fighting, I'm just going to quit. Oh, but then I had a couple who was just racing as hard as they could running, had that baton ready to pass it off to the next ones in line, and they were running neck and neck, and all of the congregation, I would have them cheering them on, come on, you can do it, don't quit, push, push, run faster, run harder. That's what the Old Testament saints are doing. They're looking down. My mama's in that grandstand. She's looking over the grandstands of heaven, and she's encouraging me, saying, don't quit. You go, girl. Keep running. Don't quit. Don't, don't grow discouraged. Don't give up. And all of your loved ones who have gone on before, all of it, maybe your father, your mother, your grandparents, friends, loved ones, who, pay, who prayed for you when you was uh, living in sin, prayed for you maybe for years, like Donna, didn't you pray faithfully for years and years for our brother? And, and what, what would happen if we'd give up and say, oh, he's never going to change. Yeah, he's, he's never going to accept the Lord. What if you'd given up? But no, you didn't. You kept pressing, you kept running, you had the race, and what happened? He gave his heart to the Lord. And that is what this verse is referring to. You got people that is looking down over the grandstands of heaven, cheering you on. They're saying, you can make it. Don't quit. Don't give up. You're almost there. We can't see how close we are to the finish line, but they can. And so they are cheering us on in our race.
praise and saying, no, quit. You, you keep you keep studying the word. You keep sitting under the, the anointed word of God because it's changing you. It's transforming you in, into being the bridal company. And you can't quit growing. We are to be changed more and more into his likeness, into his image of our beloved bridegroom, Jesus. If you quit, quit growing, quit maturing, and the Lord, you will be disqualified in your race. How do we know? Paul tells us. First Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. One, only one. Everybody's running in that race, but there's only one first place winner. Paul says, so run that ye may obtain. Paul is referring to the Isthmus Games. The Isthmus Games were held there in Corinth, and they were held every year. And this is a foot race that Paul is referring to. And to be a runner in the Isthmus Games, it required a trainer to train for 10 months straight, enduring the heat, enduring the cold, and being on a strict diet, giving up everything that was pleasurable to their flesh. Why? In order to, to be in shape, in order to run this race. And you know what the winner in this race received? A wreath of woven vines with leaves. Now, how long is that going to last? About three hours. But they trained and they gave up everything. They pushed their body for 10 months in order to train for this race. I understand what all of these race illustrations that Paul writes about because I have been an athlete all my life. And I would train, I would push my body to the limits and excel in whatever sport I was, I was playing at the time. And especially when I got into bicycling. I mean, I trained and I trained when I would ride bicycle marathons. I would push my body to the limit. Why? Because I wanted to be in that marathon race. So I understand these race illustrations that, that Paul gave. And in Hebrews, it, it's talking about that great cloud of witnesses, those who are looking over the grandstands, cheering us on. Well, the writer of Hebrews is referring to the Grecian games. And they were, uh, uh, that was another type of foot race. So, so the Olympics are not anything new. They just finished the Olympics. I didn't watch it. I don't watch TV. But the Olympics are not something that's new. The Olympics have been in existence for thousands of years. Paul was familiar with them. He wrote about them. And so now 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. Look at it again. Know ye not the day which run in a race, run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that you may obtain. And everyone that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. What was their prize? That wreath of vines woven together in it to form a circle the wreath with the leaves that was placed upon their head, that was their prize for training for, for 10 months straight in order to run in these Isthmus games here in Corinth. And at verse 26, Paul says, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means that when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. Look at this word castaway. It's adokimos. Adokimos is the Greek word. And it means unapproved. It means rejected. It means worthless. In other words, 
disqualified from the race if the great apostle Paul who wrote two thirds of the New Testament said that he had to keep his body under or die to his flesh in order to grow spiritually and to become mature in the Lord so that he could run his race and cross the finish line and not be disqualified or rejected. If Paul had to do this, how much more do we have to run our race of life faithfully and grow and mature in the Lord and allow the Lord Jesus through the precious Holy Spirit to change us and to, to form us, to get rid of the spots, the blemishes, the sin that does so easily beset us so that all the weights lay aside so that we can run our race, be changed, transformed into his likeness so that we will be that bride that shines with his radiance, with the glory that our beloved bridegroom has. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 16 through 23. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Here it is. Jesus was the first one raised from the dead. He was raised three days after the Feast of Passover, which begins the Feast of First Fruits. Jesus was resurrected from that grave on the third day, the Feast of First Fruits. He fulfilled this feast that we are studying. Verse 20, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits. We look at it again. He is the first fruits of them which slept. He arose first. He came out of that grave first. And then many, not all, but many of the Old Testament saints rose. Verse 22, for as in Adam all died, and so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order. Christ the first fruits afterward, they which are Christ at his coming. Jesus was the first fruits, the first to be raised from the dead. And then this passage tells us that then everyone else in his own order, his assigned number, his appointed rank, his position in line, if you want to think about it like that. The many Old Testament saints who came out of that grave after Jesus' resurrection and appeared unto many in the city. And then, not just them, but every other Christian since then who has paid the price to grow, to mature spiritually, they'll also be resurrected in their assigned rank, in their order. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 35. But some men will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? How, what are they going to look like when they're raised from the dead? Paul answers them a few verses later in verses 40 through 42 of 1 Corinthians 15. There are also celestial bodies, meaning heavenly bodies, the sun, moon, stars, and bodies, terrestrial, earthly bodies, down here on earth. Oh, but the glory of the celestial, the, the heavenly is one, and the glory of the terrestrial, the earthly, is another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star different from another star in glory. It's just like the sun. It's, it shines brighter than the moon, doesn't it? And you look out at night, some stars are shining brightly. Some stars are so dim you can hardly see their light. And that's how it's going to be with the resurrected saints. Verse 42, so also is the resurrection of the dead. We will shine with the radiance of glory according to the price that we have paid to be formed into the likeness and the image of Jesus, our beloved bridegroom. The brighter we shine, the more price we pay, 
the more Christ-like we have become, then the closer we will be with Jesus, our beloved bridegroom, and those who have fully paid the price to die to their flesh, to be a part of his bride. We'll be wearing our wedding garment of his light, his glory. Hello, do you want to know him? Do you really want to know him? In Matthew chapter 22, verses 2 through 14, oh, I wish we had time to read this. Jesus told a parable of a king. He's, it's a parable really about him, King Jesus. Uh, it's a parable, parable about a king who prepared a wedding. Oh, this father in this parable of this story that Jesus is telling, this father prepared a wedding for his son. And this father went to his service to tell to tell them to go and invite the guests. And then later when everything was prepared, he sent his servants out to it to come to the wedding celebration. Oh, but the king came in to that wedding banquet, and there was one man there. It has the, and among all of the guests at his son's wedding, there was one there that did not have on a wedding garment. Read it, Matthew chapter 22. This is verses 11 and 12. And the king told his servants, What, what is this one that came in? To my son's wedding without a wedding garment. Cast this man out. Get him out of the banquet room. Verse 13. The king told his servants, you throw this man out. He will not get to stay and watch my son's wedding. Now, in Bible days, the host of the wedding, the, the Jewish father, always provided white garments, white garments for each of his guests that he had invited. He provided white, a white wedding garment for each of them to wear. But this one man refused to put on that wedding garment that the Jewish father had provided for him. Out of his rebellion, disobedience, he refused to put on that wedding garment, verses 13 through 14. Oh, now think about it. Jesus has provided a garment of righteousness for us to wear. Oh, but we have to be obedient. We have to put it on. We must not refuse to pay the price and allow the Holy Spirit to do that inward work in us, to change us, to transform us into the likeness, into the image of the glory of our beloved bridegroom. This man, he had been thrown out of the banquet hall. He did not even pay the price to qualify to be a guest at the wedding, much less to be a part of the bridal company, much less to be the bride. In Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13, Jesus tells the parable of the ten virgins. Five were wise, they took oil in their lamps, oh, but five were foolish, they did not take extra oil. Read it, you are familiar with it. How many hundreds of times have you heard this preached over the years? The five foolish did not take oil, and oil in Scripture is a type, a shadow, a picture, a symbol of the precious Holy Spirit. Matthew chapter 25, verses 5 through 7. While the bridegroom tarried, they all, all ten of them, the five wise, the five unwise virgins, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Hine hakatan, behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. So the five foolish virgins, they had not paid the price to have their vessels, their body full of the oil, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, so that they could burn brightly. I don't want to be a dim star, just by the barely flicker of a candlelight. I want to burn brightly. I want to be formed into the likeness, into the image of my beloved bridegroom. Oh, these five virgins, they, the foolish ones, they did not even get to be a guest at the wedding. Or much less be a part of the bride company. They were left outside the door. Verse 
verses 8 through 13. Like I said, I wish we had time to read all these passages, but we don't. In Matthew chapter 25, verse 10. And while they, the five foolish virgins, went to buy oil for their lamps, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Oh, everybody says, I want to be a part of, I want to be one of the five. I don't want to be a, one of the five foolish virgins. I want to be one of the, the, the five wise virgins. I don't. These five wise virgins, they were only guests at the bridegroom's wedding. They were the bridesmaids, but they were not the bride. I don't know about you. I don't want to be just a guest at my beloved bridegroom's wedding, but I want to be his bride. But what it was going to require, I must pay the price. You must pay the price. If you want to be his bride, do you want to know him? Be ready. Want to know him. In the book of Hosea, chapter 2, chapter 6, verses 2 through 3, after two days will he revive us. In the what? The third day he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. Then shall we know if we fall on to know the Lord. Being a part of the bride of Christ is not automatic. There's a price to be paid. Then we will know if, only if, we fall on to know the Lord. It only if we grow mature spiritually. It's only if we fall on to know Him. If we desire to know Him. It's only when we are willing to pay the price to be changed into His likeness, into His image. So that we'll be able to shine with the radiance of His glory. It, and then we will know Him deeply and intimately. When will He revive us? When will, will He raise us up to live in His sight? This scripture says on the third day. Remember, Jesus was the first fruits, the first one to be raised from the dead. Fulfilling this feast that we're studying, the feast of first fruits. Oh, He arose on that third day. And then we, the many who will pay the price, we will live in his sight. We will live in his intimate presence. The bride, we will be one with him. Glory. There's a beautiful scripture about a bridegroom and his bride in the book of Psalms, chapter 45, verses 11 through 15. So shall the king greatly desire... Not his own beauty, but thy beauty. For he is thy Lord, and worship thou him. The daughter of Tyre shall be there with a gift. Even the rich among the people shall entreat thy favor. The king's daughter is all glorious within. Her clothing is of wrought gold. What's this describing? The bride's wedding garment. She shall be brought into the king in raiment, tapestry of needlework. The virgins, her companions that follow her, shall be brought unto thee. The bridesmaids, verse 15, with gladness and rejoicing shall they be brought. They shall enter into the king's palace. This is a beautiful description of a Jewish wedding in Bible days. Verse 11, the king desires the beauty of his bride. Who is the, the king? King Jesus, our beloved bridegroom. We, his bride, are to worship him. I worship our beloved bridegroom. Verse 12, the wedding guests, who are they? The daughter of Tyre, the other rich people who are bringing their wedding gifts to present to the bride and the bridegroom. Verse 13, the bride is glorious. What? How? Not outwardly, no, the bride is glorious within. It is an inward work of the heart that makes the bride beautiful on the outside. Verse 14, the bride is brought into the king in raiment or tapestry of needlework. Think about it, every kind word, every act of obedience, every time you read and study the word, every time that you and I spend time in prayer, Every time we get into his presence, we are weaving our garment, our wedding garment that we will wear throughout eternity. Do you want a bright, shining wedding garment, shining as a bright star? Or are 
you willing to have just a damn as dingy wedding garment to shine like that, that star that's just twinkling like a candlelight? Oh, I want to have my garment shining bright to present myself as the bride. They, everything you do on here on this earth, you're weaving your wedding garment that you're going to wear through eternity. And it's through the grace of the precious Holy Spirit who works holiness in our hearts, making us all glorious, not on the outside, but within, giving us the garment of the Christ's righteousness as our clothing of raw gold to be brought into the king, wearing our raiment or tapestry of needlework. If we're not formed enough into our beloved bridegroom's likeness and into his Yet then, we need more needlework. We need more flesh to be pierced, to be stitched, to be sewn. We got to be formed more and more into his likeness. Do we, does our flesh like to give up what it wants? No, no. Our flesh goes kicking and screaming all the way. We don't want to get up an hour early and get dressed and come to Sunday morning Bible study. We don't want to spend time at night reading the Word when we could be watching TV or YouTube or have that cell phone in our hands. No, but if we want to be a part of the bride, we got to be willing to pay the price. Oh, I, I want my flesh to be stitched, pierced, sewn. Oh, I want to be shaped. I want to be formed in his likeness, to be brought into the presence of my beloved bridegroom, King Jesus, in that raiment, in that tapestry of needle work. For Paul said, 1 Corinthians 15, 31, I die daily. Oh, it takes dying daily, doesn't it? Tired desires, the lust of our flesh, our own will, our plans, what we want. We it all must die. Verse 14, the virgins, her companions, follow her. These are the bridesmaids, the bridesmaids that accompany the bride to the wedding. Verse 15, the bridesmaids get to attend. They get to watch the wedding ceremony. They get to be part of the wedding celebration. But they are not the bride. It's only the bride who gets to be married to her king and come to his intimate presence to be one with him, to know him deeply and intimately. That's the cry of my heart. Is it yours to know him? It was the cry of Paul's heart in Philippians chapter 3, verses 10 through 14. What does Paul say? That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. How is Paul going to know him? He tells us. How are we going to know him? Paul tells us it's through the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death, dying to our flesh. Paul writes it in verse 11, If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained or already arrived, Either were already perfect, but I follow after. If that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren and sistren, I count not myself to have apprehended or arrived. But this one thing, one thing, what's the one thing that you do, Paul? Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Here's another race illustration. Paul was so familiar with the, the, the Olympic races. Paul wanted to know him. But how was he going to come to know the Lord? By keeping on running his race in life. And leaving behind the past sins, the past failures, pressing on, reaching forward in order to run the race. The prize of the high calling of Christ. What was it going to involve? The fellowship of his sufferings, Paul said. He, he had to endure and we will have to endure the tests, the fiery trials, the problems. Oh, when the enemy wants us to get discouraged and quit running our race in life. To then quit 
quit growing, quit maturing in our Christian walk. And everybody gets discouraged at times. I get discouraged. And you're saying, what? There's no way. Yes, way. I do get discouraged at times. I study day and night. And, and there are times when I get discouraged. And I think, what is the point? Used to, especially before I retired, some nights I would sit up almost all night long. I would lay down an hour or two just to rest for a minute, get up, go to work, and come home from work, study I'm all evening, all night again on weekends, and I still do it now that I'm retired. Some nights I sit up all night long studying the Word, and yes, I get discouraged. The enemy's saying, what good does that do? Look at all of the people who come for well, praise and worship in the sermon, but look at all these empty seats here for the teaching. Nobody wants to hear you teach. Why are you giving up your life? I give up going places, doing things, all that I want to do. I give it up all the time. Why? To pay the price, to study word, to, to know the word of God. I want to know him. I want to know his word. And yes, I get, I get discouraged, but at times I'll be reading and it'll just be like, like, like the Holy Spirit illuminates one, one passage. And I'll see it and I'll look at it and I'll say, yes, yes, that's a nugget of truth that I never saw before. And I will sit and run my fingers over the words and I, I will just... Just say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. It is worth paying the price. If nobody else wants to know, then they learn the word. I want to know the word for myself because it says I've come to know the word that I'm going to come to know you, Jesus, my beloved bridegroom. Oh, I've given up everything. I've given up careers in order to pay the price to, to continue studying. I gave up the career of being in the financial area, of being financially secure. I gave that up. I gave up my dream of being and having a job to work 20 years, then retiring, full retirement. I gave up everything of importance. I gave up being married again. That was the, has always been the longing of my heart. After my divorce, God, send me a husband that will love me just as you, Christ, love your church. And I, I long to have that for all these years. I, I, I would pray and say, God, why? Would you put such a big lover in me and not give me someone to love and share that love and share my life with? But it's part of the price. Catherine Kuhlman, I was watching a, a video of her years ago, and she said, if you really want to know the price, it will cost you everything. She said, I can take you to the spot where Catherine Kuhlman died. Oh. I know that price. She laid down everything that she wanted in order to serve the Lord fully, completely. She said, I know the place. I can take you to the spot where Catherine Kuhlman died. She died to her flesh, her desires, her will in order to pay the price. And my, what a great healing evangelist. There's nobody else in their lifetime that has, has been so, as great a healing evangelist as Catherine Kuhlman. She wanted to know the Lord. I want to know the Lord. Paul wanted to know him. Moses wanted to know him. Oh, do you want to know him? Moses said, oh, look at this passage, Exodus 33, 13. Moses said, now, therefore, I pray thee, if I have found grace or favor in thy sight, shoot me now thy way that I may know thee. That was the cry of Moses' heart, to know the Lord. In Exodus chapter 33, verses 17 through 19, the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace or favor in my sight, and I know thee by name. I want to know the Lord. Most of all, I want him to know me. Verse 18, Moses said, I beseech thee, Shoot or show me that glory. And God said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. Oh, I don't want to 
just know about him, but I want to know him. I want to know him intimately and become one with him. Just like Paul, just like Moses, the cry of my heart is that I may know him. Do you want to know him? It's only if we are willing to pay the price to fall on to know him that we will know him in a deep and an intimate way to become one with him, his bride. Anytime the scripture talks about knowing him, it's referring to that intimate relationship. Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived. It's that intimate marriage relationship. And we are to know him, to become one with him. If we want to be his bride, think about it in Jesus' ministry. There was always a group within a group. There were the, there were the 70 disciples that Jesus sent forth. And then within the 70, there was the 12 that he chose to be with him all the time. Oh, but within that 12, there was the inner three of Peter, James, and John. Oh, but there was only one of that inner three who laid his head upon Jesus' chest and heard the quiet longings and heard the heartbeat of his master. That was John the Beloved. I want to be that one who is his bride, who leans my head upon his chest and hears his heartbeat and hears the quiet longing. I want to become one with him. I want the wedding guest. The bridesmaids and all of the other guests at the wedding to look at me and my beloved bridegroom. And I want it to be said of me in Song of Solomon chapter 8 verse 5. Who is this that cometh up from the wilderness leaning upon her beloved? I want to be that one. I want to be the bride. Song of Solomon chapter 2 verse 16. The bride says, my beloved is mine and I am his. Psalm of Solomon chapter 5 verse 16. His mouth is most sweet. Yea, he is altogether lovely. Our beloved bridegroom is altogether lovely. And we have the opportunity to pay the price. Not to be a guest at the wedding. Not to be the bridesmaids. But we have the opportunity to be his bride. So that we marry him Become one with him. I don't want to be a guest. I don't want to be out in the audience watching the wedding ceremony. I don't want to be a bridesmaid, be a part of the wedding, but not be the bride. I want to be his bride. Do you? Amen. amen. We got to pay the price. Pay the price. Can you say amen? amen. 